We will have a live speaker here. Uh, her name is Noura. She's a Palestinian uh, who was born in Lebanon, and this is one issue that is very often forgotten, and the issue is the uh, enshrined in the UN Charter. It's the right of return for, uh, for people to come back to their own land. And uh, Noura now uh, lives in Lithuania, and we're happy, very happy that she's, uh, she's here, and she will talk about uh, her own story. Uh, there's enough of generalized politics. Uh, uh, all this politics, at the end of the day, is very personal. Noura. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Noura. Uh, there is so much to talk about, so I wrote it on paper because it's a long story, so. <laughs> okay, so my name is Noura. I am uh, a Palestinian refugee, born and raised in Lebanon. Um, right now, I'm living in Vilnius. I'm doing my master's and working. Uh, actually, my master's is, um, I'm doing it on Palestine. So I'm studying um, right now, uh, the depiction of Palestinians in American and European media and uh, in relation to Orientalism. So, um, I'm a third generation Palestinian refugee, born and raised in Lebanon, as I said, and uh, legally I'm stateless and a refugee. Um, I'm stateless because um, when Palestine was occupied, there is no longer Palestine now, so how can I be a citizen of a country that does not exist anymore, according to the international community? Uh, so uh, I'm neither a Palestinian nor Lebanese, and um, like I have a passport, but the passport is not really a passport. It looks like a passport, but it says it's a travel document, so it says uh, it's a travel document for Palestinian refugees uh, born in Lebanon. So our case is very exceptional, and um, yeah, not many people are like us. So um, why am I stateless and why am I a refugee? It's because I inherited the status of a uh, refuge from my grandfather, who was born um, in Safuri, which is a village next to Nazareth in northern Palestine. Uh, he was forced to be displaced from his village. And uh, after the village was ethnically cleansed in 1948, um, Israel built a settlement on the village's ruins and named it Siburi. So the year 1948 has been like a life-changing year because it changed my, my family's history and it, it really dictated our destinies. So, but the, uh, I will tell you a story about my grandfather and how um, he actually ended up in Lebanon being a refugee uh, because of one single decision that my grandfather's mother made 75 years ago. So the story goes like this. Uh, so on July 1st in 1948, my grandfather's village was attacked. And on that day, um, it was a normal day, but it happened that my grandfather's mother was visiting her uh, family. And she took only my uh, grandfather and his sister, while um, the rest of my uh, grandfather's uh, sisters uh, and brothers stayed with their father in their house. Uh, so um, the village was attacked. And my grandfather's mother ran away with her family, and she took my grandfather and his sister with her. Um, and they walked and walked till they reached southern Lebanon, and they stayed in tents, and these tents eventually developed. They became refugee camps. So in one single day, my family became refugees from Palestine to Lebanon. And uh, this refugee camp is called Ain al-Hilwi camp now, and um, which where I was born and raised for 18 years of my life. And uh, it's a very small camp, like one square kilometer maximum for um, 
which is, and it's a home for over 70,000 Palestinians. So you can imagine how crowded it is. Yeah, it is very crowded. And uh, so what happened to my grand's father, father, and his other siblings, they got displaced in another part of Palestine. They stayed in Palestine, um, and they resettled in the city of Nazareth. And uh, so, so it's, it's very heartbreaking to think that 1948, which is 75 years ago, was the last year that my grandfather ever saw his family, ever saw his sisters and brothers and, uh, and father. And um, my grandfather died four years ago of cancer, and like he never saw his homeland again, he never saw his siblings, he never saw his father. Yeah. But the thing is that about Palestinians and their stories is that it, it is heartbreaking, but it's not the only heartbreaking story. There are millions of Palestinians with just heart-wrenching, heart how they were displaced, how like families completely torn apart by reality, by occupation. And um, and the, the year 1948, um, it's a it's a milestone year because you know towns and villages were ethnically cleansed, and people are, were being massacred. And uh, as I said, families were really torn apart by a foreign occupation, which is something that we never chose, but it's a reality that was imposed on us as Palestinians. And um, yeah, so it was a clear fact for everyone that. Palestine has been occupied and that we lost our homeland. And that is how we became refugees. And um, I don't know if you know, but Palestinians are the largest refugee uh, population in the world. So every in every um, uh, one, um, every one in three refugees is actually a Palestinian. So uh, was, the question is, why was my grandfather never allowed to uh, reunite with his family? And why am I not allowed to go back to Palestine? So, in brief, Israel does not allow it. So, um, the irony is, is that any Jewish citizen of any country who has never been uh, to Israel can move there and can settle and gain citizenship. But Palestinians who were expelled in 1948 and their descendants are banned from returning back home or even entering Palestine. So I cannot even vis visit Palestine, although I am a descendant of um, my grandfather who was born and raised in a village in northern Palestine before the occupation. And this goes against the General Assembly United Nations uh, resolution, which is uh, 194, because it asserts that um, every Palestinian has a right to return, but Israel still rejects the resolution and does not want to fulfill it, unfortunately. So uh, throughout the 23 years of my life, I have always felt um, an exile and out of place, and um, being a refugee uh, and denied the most basic human rights, um, even denied the right to belong to a homeland. And um, the issue of Palestinian refugees is really underreported. And um, me and other Palestinian refugees, we really feel like our story is forgotten because um, like Palestinian cause itself, it's underreported. But even the issue of refugee itself is more underreported than the Palestinian cause. So we really feel that we are always left out of the conversation. And that's why I wanted to speak a little bit about my family history, so that you can give like um, and give you a general idea of wh what happened. But um, the interesting thing about Palestinians is that you think if Palestinians got this place from Palestine that they and uh, me, because I've never been to Palestine in my life and I was born in Lebanon, then oh, we must, we must, um, 
I must be Lebanese, you know, I must speak Lebanese, act Lebanese, feel Lebanese, which is true partly, but um, but it's not really the case. Uh, the interesting thing, the interesting thing about Palestinian refugees is that um, they speak and live like they were never uprooted from Palestine. So you really find millions of Palestinian refugees who who were never been never been to Palestine in their entire life, but speak the exact same dialect as the as um, as their grandfathers from the villages. So um, after a social like the right social media, I got to meet uh, people from uh, who who are from my village uh, and who live in Nazareth. And when we speak with each other, I speak exactly the same dialect as them. Just that it's something that was passed on. We we never really forgot our roots. We it's like we never really left Palestine. So um, Palestinian refugees they still keep the traditions alive. They wear traditional Palestinian clothes. They do Palestinian embroidery. They cook Palestinian dishes. They sing Palestinian songs. Re really, they love life and they um, commemorate our loss of homeland every single day. Because living in refugee camps, it's like um, a, a refugee camp is the place where it always reminds you of what your grandparents went through, what the reality is, and um, and it really reminds you of the injustice that has been done um, to you, to your parents, grandparents, to your homeland, to your people. Um, but at the same time, I will not be a very like perfectionist in my um, speech, and I just want to note that um, I have been through like phases in my life where I was really lost with regards to my identity, and I didn't know who I am because I've always felt this identity crisis. And like, am I Lebanese? Am I Palestinian? I'm. I'm. I am both and I'm neither at the same time. So it's always been like a clash for me psychologically. Um, and uh, I always like felt unworthy of the title Palestinian um, because I never lived under occupation or blockade. Uh, and even the last that, like the la in the last event that I attended, I met Palestinians here from Jerusalem and Ramallah. And while I was talking with them, I felt like I don't like um, I don't deserve to be Palestinian like them because they live under occupation. They live under apartheid regime, but I don't. I, I I grew up in a refugee camp. I grew up outside Palestine, so I don't really deserve the title of being a Palestinian. But that is a very very dangerous narrative, and I think I'm not the only one who goes through this. I'm pretty sure that there are millions of Palestinian refugees who go through the same feeling. Um, I grew up to realize um, that all Palestinians experience occupation in very different ways, and I do not need to be under occupation in the West Bank or under a blockade or siege in Gaza or face racism and harassment in 1948 occupied territories just to feel like I deserve being a Palestinian. Because um, even Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and elsewhere have also suffered from Israeli occupation. Uh, so our cases are different and we experienced occupation in, in, in different ways. So I myself survived an Israeli war in 2006. I was only six years old when Israel invaded Lebanon, and uh, we had to leave the camp for two weeks because it was going to be bombed, uh, which happened. Uh, some Palestinians were killed by Israeli airstrikes. And I remember nonstop bombing and heavy strikes. And for a whole month, we lived in a state of trauma and, and fear and felt like we really could get killed any second. And and there are like um, moments in my life where, where I always say, oh, no, I don't really have traumas. I'm okay. I'm a normal functioning human being. But there are certain moments where I feel like, oh, like the trauma's there. Like up to, up to the state, although I was only six when the war happened, 
But sometimes uh, when I hear ambulances, which is very weird, immediately it gives me flashbacks of the war. Yeah. So um, you can imagine. So of course there is trauma in every person who's been through war. And of course, uh, how can I how can I forget photos of uh, bloodied dead bodies of children in Qana in southern Lebanon, but Israel committed the massacre. So by the age of six, I knew that we were running away from the very same system of occupation that denied my grandfather his family, and the very same system of oppression that made me a status refugee. But about Lebanon, that was not the first time that they commit a massacre because Lebanon has suffered a lot from Israel occupation and even now it's still suffering with the current um, events that are happening. And I just want to highlight very quickly because it's a very important uh, turning point to Palestinian history in Lebanon, which is the Sabra and Shatila massacre. I don't know if you know about it, but it's a very like known event. Uh, so in 1982, uh, Israel committed Sabra and Shatila massacre. Well, um, I don't know if I can choose the word committed, but they more of like facilitated the massacre that happened back in Lebanon. Uh, so it happened in two refugee camps, Sabra and Shatila. Uh, they are in Beirut, which is the capital of Lebanon. And uh, the camp was besieged for three days. And um, more than 3,500 Palestinians and Lebanese people were killed, all of them, um, in just three days. And in the testimonies of people, they recount horrific acts of slaughter, mutilation, rape, and mass graves. And the United Nations General Assembly declared the Sabra and Shatila massacre to be an act of genocide back then. And just, um, it's really interesting how the past is always intertwined with present and the future. It's, um, it's like for me un in unimaginable to think that thousands of Palestinians have gone or going through the same thing in Gaza. Like it's something the human mind that cannot comprehend for me. What we are witnessing now is a genocide. Entire families are being wiped away. Children are being shelled till their organs burst out of their little bodies. And um, according to Euromed Human Rights Monitor, just to give you some like uh, an idea of what's happening in Gaza right now, it's that more than 21,000 Palestinians are killed by the Israel occupation. And these people, they're not just numbers or statistics that the UN publishes or a human rights organization just put charts on and whatever they are real people they are they are men children women they are you know they have uh, dreams and hopes and stories and they have their own they're normal human beings they have their good and bad habits they have their fears and dreams and hobbies etc and for me, every Palestinian loss feels like it's a um, loss as if it's from my own family. And the thing it really hurts, it's that it's an eternal scar, but how to forget and where is this, the escape out of all of this, if this still continues up till now. And... Um, Another interesting thing about Palestinian refugees in Lebanon is that I have met many, many, many Palestinian refugees who still have keys of their homes back in Palestine. Um, like literal keys of their homes that they left because I met many Palestinians who told me that uh, we really thought that it's going to be one week and we will go back to our homes, but it never happened. It's been 75 years and people are still refugees. People are still deprived of basic human rights. And they never, it's not that they never, they never got the chance, it's that they are never allowed to go back home. This is the issue. And um, for them, even though all of these traumatic experiences that they've been through or 
all of these horrible conditions that they live under is that they have a really amazing weapon, which is hope. It really keeps you going forward. And as my grandmothers um, always insist on telling us that if you do not get a chance to return, it will be um, your generation. If, if it is, um, and if it's not your generation, it will be a, the grandchildren of your generation. And if it's not the grandchildren, like, like and so on. So it's always like, like you will, we will return someday. If it's not us, then it's you. And um, sometimes um, I think to myself that if my grandmother's mother, um, sorry, my grandfather's mother never got, uh, never went to visit her family that day, would they still have remained in Palestine? And if that is the case, then maybe I would not be here right now because that means that my grandparents uh, and my parents wouldn't have met, so. Um, but even if they stayed in Palestine, nothing really would have changed because there will still be a reality of occupation. There will still be the issue of, of refugees that is has not been solved up till now. And with occupation, um, experiencing it, living under it, is that your life is now never yours. Everything is dictated by them. You don't feel like you are in control of your life and that everything is destined, everything is destined. Like everything, so I feel like right now, my, my life is destined, was destined 75 years ago. That's how I feel every day. And um, being a Palestinian, a Palestinian refugee means that what you could have been have been taken away from you, forcibly, unfortunately. And being descendants of the survivors, which I consider one of the most greatest injustices in modern history, I feel like we became witnesses who witnessed nothing. And um, for me, like Palestine has always been a home that I'm so close to, but I'm denied. So just to sum everything up, is that Palestinians who live in Palestine under occupation, were in the West Bank or um, in Gaza or in the 1948 territories, which were occupied back then, or Palestinian refugees outside Palestine, they all deserve a right to their homeland. They deserve a life without occupation, without oppression, without apartheid. We deserve to return back home. And we deserve also to hold um, war criminals accountable for their crimes. And um, I will conclude lastly in my mother's words, something that she's written in Arabic, but I'll translate it to English. She wrote like this. We who have longed for life, the abandoned, the suppressed, the pursued, the confrontational, the strong, the dreamy civilians, the ordinary hopefuls, the people of toughness, Palestine is ours. We love it as it befits us. We love it and it loves us. We sing for it, draw it and write it. We carry it on our hearts, we carry it in our hearts. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. And <laughs> I spoke a lot. <laughs> thank you. And um, I just want to say thank you for your interest in Palestine. And please, like, don't stop speaking about Palestine, spreading the word, and um, um, like, stand up against occupation, oppression, stand up for human rights everywhere, not just in Palestine, uh, for, for refugees' rights and um, demand a ceasefire now. And please don't stop talking about Palestine. Palestinians really need you. Thank you so much.